Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Jeff Has Cool Friends. I am Jeff May and I have very cool friends. And today I am joined by one of those very cool friends. I am very excited to have artist and art mentor, Koi Fam. Koi, how you doing, bud? Hey, Jeff. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, you are one of my favorite people, Jeff. <laughs> uh, stop it. <laughs> Cut it out. But also, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's cool, man. We've been like, how long have I known you since? Like, wow. Ready? It's I believe 2007 or 2000. Really? It's either 2007 oh. or 2009. We met at Wizard World Philadelphia. Um, yeah. You were in the Marvel booth. Okay. You were. I had already been there. All right. Cool. Cool. You were sketching. And uh, and uh, you did a Punisher for me because I did Dealer's Choice, and uh, okay. and you sketched a Punisher, and you said um, you said to me I was uh, you said I'm channeling Jim Lee a bit in this one. Ah uh, ha man, I've come a long way. I've a lot to say on that stuff, but um, that that is funny. That those were the days with um, when Marvel and DC used to come to the Wizard shows, right? Like that was a big. Wiz big deal. Yeah, wi I mean, for a while, like Wizard was sort of like the the B plus of 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 Comic Cons. They 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 did a pretty good job for like this five year chunk. Yeah, especially for East Coasters, right? Because you had San Diego, then otherwise. Yeah, so there was like oh, San yeah. Diego. Even New York Comic Con wasn't the wasn't what it is now. Like no, they weren't even they weren't even they had the big Apple Con. There was a uh, great little shows, but I don't even think the Javits thing was a thing. No, it wasn't at the time. And then I remember there was like this big schism because New York Comic Con was happening by Reed Pop, who uh, owns uh, owns uh, I think C two E two was their big one, the big Chicago yeah. one. And Wizard had uh, done Big Apple Con the same weekend. Mm -hmm. And like the entire comics industry was like picking sides. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. it was wild. I, rem I remember looking at that being like, man, this is some weird shit yeah, to look yeah. at here. That's just a little poke in. But yeah, the Comic Cons were one of those situations where you're just sitting there being like, Oh, so this is like the world now. Like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep coming to these and keep enjoying them. And I did. When did you first start uh, going? Because I didn't, you know, I, I, I only thought there was San Diego. I had no idea that there were other conventions. Well, I used to go to a wizard Philly. I used to go to like basement conventions. So I used yeah. to go to a lot of those, like you go to like a Radisson into yeah. like one of the meeting rooms and there's is, like is it like is it like like by law it has to be a radisson because that's the only other hotel show i bet you it was at a radisson i, I think radisson's and um like uh well uh, holiday inns right, right like right. I, I remember going to a, a my fair share i believe i went to one at the holiday inn in boxborough massachusetts yeah like but i would but we didn't have any there were no big conventions really in the yeah. east especially like when you're like young because I yeah. was a teen and like, where was I going to go? Yeah. Like, who was going to yeah. drive me there? Comics weren't what they are now. Like, now yeah. they are a mill for IP. Yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Because, yeah, I'm one of my first, I did the Wizard Philly along, like 2003, I think, right? Then I went to Little Radisson one um, in Jersey. And uh, uh, like Joe Q was there. And Jimmy Palmiotti was there. But, um, the next thing you know, I'm at uh, Wizard World Philly signing with Joe Q. So it's kind of kind of trippy. That that's that Joe Q being um, Joe Casada, who uh, Marvel, yeah, I believe, right. uh, now Marvel president. Correct. He was uh, the editor in chief at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So for for those, because I, I know that you know when we're talking, obviously that's talking shop. But for a lot of people, they'd be like, I don't know who you're talking about. Joe Q is a pretty huge deal in that he was this superstar artist of the 90s he was sort of uh going about sort of creating his own thing marvel pulled him in he gave him the marvel night series so the ground characters that you saw like the netflix tv show people yeah basically right right that's all joke so he was in charge of that and then they gave him the reins of of just marvel in general and he mm -hmm. came in and he 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 fixed some things, whether for the for the good or the bad, you know, it's Peter not being married to Mary Jane. That was his decision. You know what? Um, I think he kicked butt. 
um, and, and failing is part of part of it. You know what I mean? But I, I applaud. I think um, made a huge difference in, in, in my opinion. But uh, I, th- I think that for all of the hits and misses, and I know a lot of people got really angry about the Peter and MJ thing, but I was like, well, that's just him ripping off a Band-Aid. Like, yeah. I understand that maybe getting to that point wasn't easy or it wasn't it was a little painful. But but when you finally reset that, when you finally go surgically repair the Spider-Man timeline to make it more in tune with the original intent of the character. Yeah, I don't think it was bad. And that's really where we started to see Dan Slott take over Spidey. And I personally think he's the best Spidey writer that we've had. So I'm Dan not, knows his stuff. Dude, Dan, Dan is awesome. He's, Dan, Dan is an amazing person. And he, he knows his stuff. And he's I, a great storyteller. I keep chasing him down uh, to oh, do this yeah? show. And our <laughs> schedules just never match up. Um, yeah. Like there was at one point in time, he was like, okay, I can do it this time. And I'm like, I'm going to be out of town. It was just yeah. like one of those uh, things because he's hard to nail down. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But yeah, so we, we met there. I believe you were uh, one of uh, Marvel's young guns. Oh, right. That right, was right. what they were doing. And <laughs> and you and another good friend of mine, Mike Choi, were in the class yeah. of the young guns. Yeah, uh, that was fun. It, what, what a what an interesting thing to sort of receive. How did you feel about that when you were sort of touted by Marvel Comics as being the future of the industry? Oh, man, that's um. Yeah, it's funny because it all ties into that first Punisher sketch. And it's funny that I said I'm channeling Jim Lee because. All of that, I look at me then and I sort of cringe, right? And it's more like, because it's like, um, I was dealing with some serious like feelings of being an imposter. Imposter right? syndrome, yeah, that's, hi, welcome to the show. Yeah, right? And it's like, uh, it's like the whole time, it's like, wow, everyone's making a huge mistake here. I shouldn't be here, right? I didn't go to art school. I didn't, I'm, I, you know, like I just like to draw, but it, but, but to me, the whole thing was like, oh my gosh, when is this all going to come crashing down and people are going to figure out, you know, like what, what's the whole thing was just really. So on the one hand, it was like awesome, you know, I was like, this is this is a dream come true. But on the other hand, it's like, what the heck am I doing here? Did you right? did you feel like you were like robbing the industry or 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 like just that you you were like they don't know that I don't know what I'm doing. Well, it comes from, and this is where the the art mentoring stuff um, has really taken shape over the last decade or so, right? Oh, you're so jumping to really... that too, because yeah, that's that's going to be something I was going to ask you in about oh, half yeah, an hour. Oh yeah, this thing, this thing, I could talk for forever on this stuff because it really is. I mean, like he, I'm sitting, I can remember sitting drawing Mighty Avengers, right, with Brian Bendis, the the aforementioned Dan Slott, right, and it's like the flagship book, and and I'm and I'm hating it. I'm hating myself. I'm hating my art. And it's like, this is terrible, terrible, terrible. I remember talking to Tom Brevoort. I was like, Tom, like, basically, like, I don't, like, are you sure? And he's like, we wouldn't be hiring you if we didn't think. But for me, the whole time, I was like, this is terrible. I was going to online and reading comments. And it's like, oh, they're right. I'm terrible. So, right? so you were, te- wait, you were telling your editor that you weren't doing a good job while you were handing in your work? Yeah, basically, right? Basically, it's oh, like, no. it's a, it's a weird, it's like, um, and, and it's, um, it's these agreements that we make, right? Like, um, especially with like strict parents and, and, and basically, uh, you know, I was, um, I was a lawyer before all of this. And okay. It's the whole... Let's talk about that for a second because, yeah. uh, cause my timeline, my schedule of how I was going to come about this show, you've, you've covered a lot of stuff. So I want to yeah. talk about that for a second. Cause then, and then yeah. we're going to lead back to that story. You were a lawyer, uh, yeah. university of Pennsylvania, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and also, uh, according to your website, a venture capitalist. Yeah, I did a little bit of that too. And then you just stopped. Yeah. So, um, like as a kid, it was always constantly drawing, constantly doodling, mm-hmm. constantly like my my head was always Marvel, Marvel, Marvel. Mar- you know what I mean? Because it's like, um, you know, as a minority and and just basically from from a strict family, and you couldn't. You know, I wasn't allowed to do certain things, right? So to me, that that's where my escape was, comics. And, and that's really where I heavily identified with, you know, the X-Men and, and the Chris Claremont days. So to me, and even when I, remember, when I was even younger, I remember going to a friend's, my parents' friend's house, and their kid had, had um, drawn a Spider-Man picture, right? And that just blew my mind. Because before then, I was drawing the Pink Panther, you know, Woody Woodpecker, Donald Duck, just, just stuff that the kids in my school, you know, they, 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 that's what they drew. That's what they knew. Right. But to me, 
Spider-Man, all that stuff was something I could see like on the cartoon or read in the books, right? But but then when I saw someone draw, I thought, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can actually create this happiness for myself <laughs> instead of being dependent on somebody else drawing it. But I was like, hey, you know, if I just drew this, I could feel good about this connection I'm having with this character on my own, right? So that's where it started getting me into the whole like, this, this, this comfort I had, I could actually do for myself, All right? So I always had that with me, right? But then, but then, you know, we hear these, these, these agreements were forced to, to sign on with, like artists don't make money. You got to be a doctor. You got to be a lawyer. And I, and I fought really hard to break that, right? I like, like I would get F's in high school. Like I would do whatever I could to say like, dude, this is not for me. You're trying to sabotage the, that professional sort of aspect of it. Absolutely. And and it's just like, no, 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 no. We'll give you another chance. We'll give you like, no, stop giving me chances. I don't, I don't want to do this. Right. But it was cause no, 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 you're, you're, you're too smart for these two, this, this, this. So so all along the way, you know, there, there are things that I'm doing like, guys, listen, I don't, I don't want to do this. I'm I'm going to destroy it. Right. (laughs) And so there's that. Right. But then, but then, so, so to me, like I was doing this, so, so I went, you know, I went to law school, you know, did, did that thing. But even there, you know, it's like these people are like Harvard, Columbia, Yale, undergrad. They're all going to, you know, and I'm sitting here like, I don't belong here. Right. And they're talking about all these law firms. Like, I don't know anything about law firms. I know nothing about the law. Right. But here I am sitting. Right. It's actually so bad that um, for orientation, right, the first year, you know, one L orientation, this big auditorium. And then you fill out this little question, these little note cards. Right. And then uh, one of the questions was, uh, write down your favorite lawyer, right? And you're like, what? Well, guess guess who I write down? Matt Murdock. Matt Murdock, exactly. Yeah. Right? So I write down Matt Murdock, like even from day one, I just was not there, right? To me, Matt Murdock was my favorite lawyer, right? I'm sure everyone else is right. Clarence Thomas, you know, O'Connor, all, all these, all these um, yeah. super lawyers. I'm like, it's, it's Matt Murdock, okay, right? <laughs> like, that, that's, like, that, that, that should have been a sign. Right. And then uh, so the, all through the whole thing, it's just like constantly trying to sabotage, sabotage, sabotage. All right. And then um, and then even then it was like, okay, I'm not doing the law thing. And then it's like, oh, well, then get go get your MBA. I say, like, what? I'm fine. I'll get my MBA. And then bam, now, now, now I'm, I'm working for a venture capital firm. It's like, how does this stuff happen? Like, I just want I just want all of this to stop. It's like you're forest gumping your way through the worst parts of life. <laughs> right, right. Like instead right. of having this like really like interesting celebrity and politician meeting thing you're just like and then i went to this other job i hated right right exactly and, and like people and it, it's like the messaging is this is good you know, you're an idiot for screwing this up like, but i don't it might be good for you but it doesn't feel good for me wow right? we, we so, got some parallels here yeah right I mean, and it's yeah, like yeah. Dude, i don't care i don't want to be alert. i don't care i really don't care about any of this stuff i just want there's something else i'm looking for right and i've learned later that's not actually drawing Right. But at the time, that's what I thought. At the time, I thought all I wanted is to draw for Marvel. So what happened was then um, I was hanging out and I, I hit a local comic store. And they're, 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 uh, the owners and her friends were, were, were working a bunch of stuff in the back room, in the back of the, of the store. And I was like, what are you guys doing? So we're getting ready for, for Comic-Con. And I was like, what? Like, I thought that only happened in San Diego. Right? <laughs> and they, like, they kind of laugh at you? No, no, they're like you know people in the business, super nice, yeah, right? Retailers, clients. Well, what's what's the name nice. of the store? It's called Tired Tiger Comics back in the day. Oh, right. Okay. It's a little a little shop in Pennsylvania here. Um, but, but now it's called F and Comics. F are they uh as is is it a good kind uh, crew still, I hope? I haven't been there a while. I know I know the owner, Tom. Um so shout out to Tom, but I don't know if Tom actually has a physical store. I think he might have switched over to, to, to online. online. I haven't been there in That's 10 smart. ages. It, it, but, it uh, stands to wit that, um, you know, there is the stereotype of the comic book guy that you yeah. see from The Simpsons. And, oh, you know, like that sarcastic, yeah. Yeah. out of shape thing. And I think once you realize uh, that I think geek culture has has mainstreamed itself so yeah. well that we have learned that that's actually that stereotype it exists to be fair yeah it isn't a, yeah. It, that's a stereotype that exists for a reason i recognize yeah. that i understand that they do exist but for the most part they are the minority of comics fans yeah i'm so happy about that because i remember seeing a few of them and it's like smoking and it's like you like do you know like do you want kids like do you want do you want to exist in 15 years because the way it is no kids coming in here 
right? I just I never understood it. <laughs> to be fair, everybody has the right to live their life however the way they want. Uh, right, I exactly. think there are a lot of people that do make excuses for negative lifestyle choices. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's again, it's n- never my life. So I'm not going to, you know, unless it's like drunk driving, then I'm going to be like, OK, I'm going to speak mm-hmm. about that. Like it, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're not endangering other people, it's fine. I absolutely agree with that. But I'm with what you, you want, but don't mess with other people's doing what they want. I'm, I'm with you. And I do see a lot of in that stereotypical group, a lot of um, misogyny. Yeah. And I think yeah. there's a lot of that coming about from people that are like, well, women have never paid attention to me. Yeah. And you're like, well, what did you do to get attention, to earn mm-hmm. that attention? Mm-hmm. You know, you're not yeah. nice. Like, if you were nicer, maybe, yeah. and like really nice, not only nice yeah. to the people you want to sleep with. Yeah. Uh, that has always frustrated me. And I see it a lot at conventions. They'll, they, mm-hmm. you know, like you're you're at a signing, for example, and you know yeah. you're a very personable person. It's why we're friends. Is that you and I had a great conversation and it sparked a really great um, relationship. I didn't just show up with a stack of books and be like, sign these. Yeah, yeah. You know, like there, there. You see that a lot. Mm-hmm. The the people that all they want to do is is view creators of art as a commodity. Yeah, and and um, what, what what do you think about that? Because I don't I don't have a problem. I mean, to me, I, I I appreciate and cherish the connections that I do make. But if the other person isn't interested, it's like like you. I hope you're living your best life, and I'm good with that. Right? I'm I'm more I'm more of a person that believes in if some if you admire or like or enjoy somebody, um, that you should learn how to be kind to them at the very least yeah understand yeah. how like for example if i had a stack of mighty avengers books and i just yeah. plopped it in front of you i would i would at least say something like i really love the way that you're incorporating the character designs into the store or yeah. something something like that where you're and yeah. i get that not everybody has all of the same social skills right right but there's something to be said about knowing objectively that if you are rude to somebody like you Mm -hmm. should know what rudeness is i guess is what i'm saying yeah well well from from so so from my side it's more like um i know there are things that i do and don't do so i I make sure i'm doing what i want to get to sort of manifest what i want right so so whoever comes to my table even if you know if, if, if you're just standing even like two feet away right it's it's like i will engage Mm-hmm. Right. I will say, hey, how are you? And I will treat everybody like like I'm trying to connect. Are you there? Are you going to pick up the phone? Right kind of deal. And um, they do. For the most part, they do. And I can get, I get it to me. If you come with a stack. Right. And then like I see other creators like glaring at them like you son of a like what you just here to get my signatures and you, you're not going to buy anything. I hate you. Like you know what I mean? So they instantly have that defensiveness where it's like, uh, like, and I don't maybe they get them signed because if they don't if they don't get a sign they don't sell they don't make money they can't pay the bills right I, I don't i don't i don't judge them i don't care right but some other people may look at them and, and these people might feel bad because it's like you know they, they are coming with a stack of stuff some people are completely oblivious right but after it's the same people i see so after a while i imagine that they're getting the feedback that they're unwanted in some way yeah right so to me it's like hey i'm gonna reach out and most of the times they are very friendly and warm and 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 it's 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 usually all good so i do what i can to sort of um make it easy for people because because i mean like like you're saying right they're all there to make that connection and they don't maybe they don't know what kind of a connection they're looking for right maybe they think that connection is just getting the book signed having a picture taken done but i was like no 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 we can we can go further that that's fair i I, my version of that which is very interesting uh it's very different but i will i'll do like a live show you know, and then I will get a tweet like two hours later from somebody that's just like saw Jeff May. I've uh, been waiting to see him for a long time. Uh, finally got to, you know, see him live instead of listening to him on a podcast. And I'm like, why didn't you say anything? And they're like, oh, I didn't want to bother you. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm not famous. Like you can bother me. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for, um, 
you your 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 fans obviously obviously know, but for anybody who's listening from my side, Jeff is awesome, funny dude. Love love the show. I'm really bummed that I missed the show that you did just up in um the New England area this past. Oh yeah, or so. yeah. I, I did four. I just got back yeah. actually. Yeah, I, I did all. I did was four booked shows, and that was it. It was yeah. there for three weeks, and I only did four shows. I picked the four cities that I love in in yeah. Mass, in New England. Yeah, but funny, that, yeah. funny dude, and especially I'm from New England. Right, I live outside of Philly now, but the jokes, I totally get it. So it really is tailored <laughs> to me. So love it. Love it. You should, you should put out a CD. Do you have a CD? Uh, no, those uh, CDs aren't a thing. That's right. Anymore. <laughs> but uh, you, an album, like I was going to record one last year. And okay. then, whoops. Uh, so I've been like trying to be like, ah, do I want, you know, like I love stand up. Um, yeah. Finding the time to do it when I'm doing four regular podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not easy. Um. Oh, right. But, right. Totally. But, you know, like, it's funny because I usually when I'm home, I make it a point to book shows in Philadelphia, even though it's a five hour drive. I have yeah. such a strong community of friends and fans in that area. Philly is such a great um, comedian friendly town. It's such an incredible art town. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I was telling people, I was like, if you went to that Philly show, it yeah. would have essentially been like you going to a low key Comic Con. Mm -hmm. I was like, Koi Pham was there, Tom Whalen was there, Dave Perillo, Scott Derby, Ian Globinger. Yeah. I was like, these are some of the most talented people in the art world today, and they are coming to just watch me talk. Ah, that's underselling. To watch you entertain, and it was very entertaining. Super entertaining. Eh, I appreciate it. But I also <laughs> I also have that uh, imposter syndrome a lot, too. So yeah. I, I guess it. funny. So you were saying about how, like... um. Like uh, you were making store appearances, right? So, let's, so that's what I've been doing. So, talking about these comic shops we were talking about, right? In terms of, um, you know, how the old old guard, literally the gatekeepers, right? Mm -hmm. Out. See yeah. you later. Because I've been um, so with this with uh, with with things opening up, I've been trying to make a real effort. Like me and my my family here, we, we call ourselves the Farm Squad, right? And we we really just try to get out there and um, just try to connect with people. Because that's where that's. that's so, so especially with everything opening up, I want we want to help out these stores. So we've been hitting a lot of local stores here in the Philadelphia area, and amazing, right? We got like to me, it's like so it's so diverse now, right? Um, it's so um, uh, like like f women owned, right? And it's just um, like just a very open you know, loving community. It's, it's awesome. And to me, like you got to support that. Yeah, it really does. I think the gatekeeping, the gates got shattered. Um, yeah. and, and I see like, for example, I live in the Burbank, California area. There are like four or five comic shops locally mm -hmm. here, um, and that are all different and all support each other, which is mm -hmm. fascinating because like, to yeah. me, I'm like, but in the world of shops, don't you want to be like the only one? And yeah. they're like, but yeah, but we're not, you know, our specific store caters to, and then, you know, fill in the blank, you know, like yeah. we're, we're more of toys and collectibles and we have some comics yeah. and we're more comics, oh. but we don't have the room for toys and collectibles. So, yeah. Speaking of like the, the camaraderie between the stores and this just new attitude of, of uplifting each other. I did uh, an appearance at the comic book shop in Wilmington, Delaware, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I'm doing an appearance today at um, the the Maroon Hornet in Oxford, PA, and they know each other, and they're saying, and they're about half an hour away from each other. They say, hey, say hi to so and so, say hi to Sarah, say hi to Randy, and it's like this is awesome. It's such a community that it's amazing, right? And then it's 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 so yeah, the stores are where it's at, and um, that's where um, that's that's how I've been keeping busy and then doing the conventions and that sort of stuff, right? But um, to bring it back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of um, the the how i became a villain story right the, <laughs> yeah the, the, the showing up to the local comic shop back then back in the day in 2003 they were doing a uh, 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 they're, they're setting up their booth and i was like what is this stuff right and then they said hey yeah there's a convention i thought well can i come it's like you can not only come you can get a table and sell your art because because i was um helping them do their comic right it's just some stranger walking in who was like venture capitalist just bored on the weekend but, hey i want to do comics and they're like okay you can draw for us they're like cool 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 so um that's where i got like where i got my real you know, got my foot in there like hey this is fun and you were just like some venture capitalist that was like essentially a hobbyist artist yeah. that was yeah. like oh i can do this thing with you and 
they were like, come on. And so that kind of, there's a little blood in the water kind of yeah, for you exactly. in that regard. So 2003 was your first convention. How long did yeah. it take before you started getting like professional work? Oh, wow. So, um, well, you helped kind of timestamp it a bit. So 2003, Marvel was at Wizard. Um, I'd set up a team. I was selling, I was selling little head sketches. I was selling sketches for like five bucks. And right away, I was like, this is too low. <laughs> so I raised it to the uh, insane amount of $15. All right. So, and then, but, the, but the, I knew that Marvel was doing portfolio review. So I set up a whole, I mean, I had a portfolio drawn and everything and I took it to Marvel and then, you know, I was, I was hooked. Um, how long later? I think, when was it that we met? 2007? Is that what you It said? was either 07 or 09. And I, I, I okay, don't remember which. Sorry. It, was, it was a few years, but um, I was staying in touch with CB Sabolsky, who's now the editor in chief. So, um, but, but, but I had the time, right? Cause I, 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 I was doing other things, but, um, but it was always like, okay, this is, this is, this is where it's going to happen. Then um, I joined the 10 ton studios crew, a bunch of my friends there. And we just started going to shows like, um, there's just, just a bunch of people. Um, that would that be had, 10 ton. I remember, I definitely remember some of the names we talked about earlier being a part of that. Cause I have oh, yeah. old ash can mini comics right, of 10 right. ton an anthology With, type thing right yeah yeah and that's the that's like a, a philly north jersey kind of like conglomerate of yeah of, yeah so, um, well comic. actually it's bigger it's bigger so um it was we, we, so we got to get together for the purpose of doing it in an anthology right mm -hmm. so um we were just like uh but because we were sort of local we would just hit conventions together uh, but we nobody was published i think i think at best uh um jason baruti had done some stuff for image uh, mm -hmm. with with jim krueger but um but but we, nobody had done anything but so we were like let's just go and hang out and just party and just just pretend we're a studio so we got we got a, we got a banner we got a whole table set up and acting like we were we were established artists right we were just there to hang out i mean fake it till you make it right yeah yeah but we were, yeah exactly but, but when you go to these conventions by yourself right especially if you're an aspiring creator you're just by yourself it's hard to it's, it's hard to find your place, mm -hmm. right? But if you roll with a crew of five, six, seven, eight people, all right, wherever you walk into, you're the interesting group now, all right? So yeah, people man. start to gravitate to you like, hey, what are you guys doing? It's like, and so, so it made it a lot easier for us to actually be chill, right? And, 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 not, and not feel, and not, and not present so like um, needy. I guess. Right? Yeah, there, there is that sort of desperation in comics yeah. of like, and especially, and you see it, there's this, there's a heartbreaking aspect to conventions sometimes. And I, maybe I'm just overthinking it when I see these, but I'll meet some people that are just marginal at yeah. art and they will be like, do you want to check out my book or do you want to check out my, my prints? Yeah, and I'm just yeah. like, Oh, keep at it. Like, yeah. I, I don't know how to react when somebody's not good and trying to sell something. And that's, that's my personal opinion yeah as in well, like it's my taste it might be yeah. great to someone else but there are some times where i'm just like oh i feel i feel rough about yeah. looking Hold on, at so speak, speaking of rough wow nice segue the dog is barking it's a good so dog one cameo. second it's like, what's the dog's name okay okay guys i'm doing a recording so if you guys want to it's okay to stop barking it's fine it's totally okay. oh, fine it's not like we're this isn't like the nbc nightly news it's my own <laughs> podcast. I don't care if you put a dog on it. We don't hate dogs here at Jeff has cool friends at patreon.com slash Jeff May. Hey, that reminds me uh, real quick. Uh, I don't know if you knew this, but I uh, do a thing on the Patreon where if you are a member of the $10 VIP producer tier, then uh, I will actually say the name of your choosing uh, on my show. Did you know I do that, Koi? I did not know. Uh, that means but, uh, that's you gonna happen. Have not been listening to this show. Uh, <laughs> how could you do that? You should have said, "Of course, I know you do that." I listen. Okay, to let's, let's every take show. two. No take of twos. Of course, no take twos. Of course, uh -huh. right, right, right. I got, I got to be genuine, and um, I'm accountable for for being a delinquent friend, dude. So I, I... The number of I've I've had friends that are just. I had a friend tell me on my when I was home. He was like, "I don't pay for podcasts," and I was like, oh, <laughs> "Okay." I was like, I don't know what you want me to do with that information. That's fine. Like, I don't need you to. Like, you've given me friendship. You don't need to give me five or ten dollars a month. I don't care. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah. get that. But I was like, but also listen, it's good. Um, but we can uh, shout out to children love the meat, Millie. Where's the Bane? The sad free willy noise. C two E two AM Adventures. You ever been to C two E two? Yeah, 
Uh, show. Great uh, show. It was great. Excellent show. I really love that. Um, Don Ass, an action figure of Clippy. Nathan Christopher Charles Ascani sung Day Spring Summers. That's a huge get for me as a as a uh, producer to get uh, Scott yeah, Summers and Jean Grey's child. Yeah, or yeah. Maddie Pryor's child. I don't know. The Bullock. Caitlin Binney, Connor, legally actionable threat, Benson. Uh, oh, legally. That's a word that you know. L Trash Blogger Seldo, the Ian McClendon, Jezbutt's going to be a dad. Oh, my God. Congratulations, Jezbutt. I let them update it. So it seems to me like Jezbutt just found out he's going to have a baby. Oh, wow. uh, well, he's not going to have a baby. He's going to own a baby. Is that right? I think it's okay to say he's having it, figuratively speaking. Yeah, that seems like stolen valor, but that's right. right. That's, I guess he that. didn't right, say right. he didn't say he's having a baby. He said is going to be a dad. So okay, gotcha, congrats gotcha, to him. Gotcha. Craft beers make my alcoholism look like a neat hobby. Uh, hi, I'm Super Fudge, and welcome to Fudgemania. Meth J, that's like my Bizarro, I guess. Uh, bold and brash, more like belongs in the trash. Russell from Jersey, pizza, bagels, Taylor ham. Are you a Taylor ham fan? Coy. Taylor Ham sounds familiar. Who's it's Taylor Ham? Something from Jersey. I don't know. It's some kind uh, of food. Somebody told me. They told me at one point in time, and and I don't know. Oh, it's a food. Oh, I thought it was a person. Okay, uh, well, that's cool. Yeah, I guess I guess there's probably a person named Taylor Ham. <laughs> that was actually my former stepdad's last name was Ham. So my mom was a was a ham at one point in time. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, it's in well, I was gonna say it's in the blood, but it's sort it's, of well, it's and something else <laughs> hey big body boy for 2069 black agar boltagon get vaccinated you chuckleheads the 5g lets you see sound and then you can see your friends again let's go i support that one a whole lot kimball just kimball i don't care if it's women's deodorant it works better and smells nicer mr billy beck i'm the law martial law and i hate superheroes blue jankles that's somebody that makes fun of uh, that's a reference to me saying that I have the ankles of a blue jay because I keep injuring them when I go for a run. Nice, nice. Like a racehorse. Essentially, but without the shooting at the end. Yeah, right. Um, uh, another sponsor, of course, being that scene in Meet Joe Black where Brad Pitt dies. Classic. We've all been there. Superman Family, number 184, Kool-Aid Molotov, Lemming Malloy, These Seven Bs, Farty Marty, a.k.a. Fartholomew Martinez, uh, Nolan Matten, Cronenberger, Grumblebee, Mike Gouts, Instagrams, at Bob, underscore, of, underscore, Skull. I bet you've met him, Coy. He came to the Philly show, uh, Bob Shaw. He's a big art collector, too. Wait, hold on. Did you say Bob Shaw? Bob Shawl with two Shawl. L's. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Not the Bob Shaw that... Uh, not the Bob Shaw. Yeah, not the from Bob Merrimack. L. Not from, from Merrimack Games and Comics and Comic Art House Bob Shaw. But yeah. Bob Shawl of Delaware. Um, I, could, huh. I would guarantee that he... he that you've met. St. Yeah. Gutfree, Funky J, Dave Knifeboot Hinson, Fushizlis Jones, JK, Jeff May's biggest fan. That's you, actually. Exploding Runes, Dil Havarti, Jolly Buckaroo, Normal Man, Andrew McGuire, Vortispin, Norm from Cheers, Shebrew Sleeps, The Ghost of Dave Thomas, Sophia Hapgood, Psychic Services, Russell Richardson, The Sass Bitch Stan. Show me in the rules where it says a dog can't play basketball. Murph the Murph, Dan Hackroyd, Willem Dafoe's Baffling Big Bonanza, Mackenzie Chill, at Nerd Numbers, Ricky Cilantro, Gray Man of the Fireside Chronicles, Lef, Domo Arigato, Andrew Roboto. The AV Foundry, uh, Gregarious Gregorio, Captain Fat Strong, Jessica Robertson, at Gavin underscore not with two T's, Cody Beck Jr., Mind Freak 555, Taurus Bulba, Huey Freeman, Lisa Harden, twitch.tv slash Firechild460. Fire, uh, follow that person if you're on Twitch. Burrito Mouth, Dr. DNA, Steven, Silius Ruby, Kelly Stanaway, Adrian, I didn't kill my wife. The most well-prepared dead guy, Jennifer Fendelin, or Bart Fartigan, and frankly, Amish. That is a lot of names because a lot wow. of people like me, and that's not wow. my fault. I wow, don't feel, that's cool. I don't feel bad about that. I don't feel bad that people want to give me a little extra money to say their name. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's all good. It's all fun. It and and I bet those people are going to be uh, finding you on social media and following you because they are fiercely loyal. So that being said, I want to talk a little bit. You have, by the way, your website is uh, pristine. Who does your website? Um, I made it. 
Okay. Uh, and my kids, uh, my kids maintain it. Uh, it, it so your website, koifam.com, because when I do my research, I, I try to do as deep as a scrub as I can. Yeah. And your website is very, you have like a comic store where you sell just like, I'm guessing, is it like your comps that you have or? Yeah, of, yeah. There's a, there's, a, there's comps, there's prints. Um, basically that's what's in the store part. Yeah. You, so, but what's wild is they're like soup, they're like cover price. Like all your stuff is really affordable for like yeah. autographed stuff directly from you. And I, I was like, oh, because I, I was I went to the comic store and, and I was like, oh, these are like wildly affordable. You have prints, you have auctions and you have comics like we can mm -hmm. literally just pick up. If I want to get your Mighty Avengers run, I can just click on your your thing and get it for cheap, really cheap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that just something that you decided instead of like lugging all these books to conventions? I learned uh, in business school, right? Uh there's, there's a thing called inventory cost, right? <laughs> Having these things sitting around like behind you, it takes up space, right? Mm -hmm. And um, they're not paying rent. So <laughs> that's that's the idea. If they're sitting there, let's just get them out of here. But in a very, like, I, I don't want to work. Like, I, I, it's more like passive, right? So it's, yeah. th that's the arrangement I have with them. You want to stay, you got to pay rent. So that's... Like, how many sales do you get on your website? of these is this something that's like a constant like you're like oh got three more this week or is it like a week of like you know nothing and then somebody buys like five or six things like how how's that how does that move i don't market it right so to me this is a very passive it's 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 just to have something on the site maybe that's like the content part of it yeah so uh so yeah people will buy something like like every week i'll, I'll sell one or two things it's, it's 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 fine a lot of the, um what, what i saw a lot is that you can buy the books at cover but then a lot of people pay um the extra for the remark oh okay so you do remarks too what what's that yeah. so if i go if i wanted to get let's say i wanted to get let's find a good uh the death or glory number one variant which yeah, you Rick sell Lander bengal uh masterpiece. correct um and that's got room I'd say for a remark yeah. on there or something, yeah. or, or, or if I wanted to get like one of your Deadpool, like the Deadpool number one variant that you have, you sell yeah. it signed on your website for 10 bucks. How much is it? If I wanted a remark of you to draw Deadpool on there? Um, it's 40, um, right now, but, um, catch it before I raise it because it's fully painted. Right. So I don't, I don't, oh. I don't just do a marker thing. I, I put, I put like the white, you yeah. know, so, so paint down and I paint it. I realized that uh, I should probably say that a remark is when you draw like a small, it's a small sketch on a comic book cover of usually, yeah. of usually like a head or a bust. Um, right. Never something, you know, you know, it's not like a full size thing, but yeah, that, it's, that's it's a, a head, a head thing. So, so 40 bucks, that's a, that's a pretty good deal. That's, I would say that that is definitely worth it. And um, some of the stuff you've done, you have an Iron Fist cover that I am just into. Yeah, that was fun. I, I liked that one. It was all in shadow. So that was fun to do. And Chris Sotomayor really, you know, knocked the colors out of the park. Yeah. But you have a lot of really, really cool stuff on that. Um, and I was wondering about that because I was like, as I was looking at that, you have um, your home, your about, your mentoring, your auctions, um, comic store, you have a blog, which is sort of, it comes off like almost a bit like your Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. That's where, um, I've, I've been very, uh, so what, when, when we, so when we set out to do the website, right. As a team, um, we weren't sure where, um, the, 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 I guess the, the connections with people were going to come from. Right. Mm -hmm. So there was the internet, there's Facebook, there's Instagram. And we were like, let's just, let's just try it all out. So as it turned out, um, everything has its own place right now. Right. So the blog doesn't get a whole lot of attention because I get all of that through the Facebook. Like I can mm -hmm. reach people to Facebook and Instagram. So the, the website really is just for like, if you have to come into the head, you're going to come to headquarters, right. For the auction. If you want to like for specific things, I would drive you there, but but the connection I'm finding just makes this as easy as for everybody just through the socials. But it's it's good to have an actual place where you can you know run a store. So you, that's what it's for. As of recording, you have a series of auctions that are about to um, sell out uh, from this, and uh, they have about uh, six hours left. 
as of recording because yeah. we're recording today on Friday and the episode goes up on Tuesday morning. Um, you have a disturbingly affordable auctions page on here of your daily sketches. Yeah. Um, and, and instead of setting the prices, you're like, if somebody wants them, you can bid on them. If not, it's fine. I'll keep them and sell them at cons, I'm guessing. So we do, uh, we do a live draw. Say we, I mean, like me, me, um, Sam, uh, her boyfriend, Steve, you know, Heather, my wife, and also mm -hmm. like my coach and mentor herself, right? She's the one that, that really helped me out through, through that. Remember, we were like uh, alluding back to the imposter syndrome days, right? So we, we, we really try to reach out and help people. Um, so we do a live draw every Tuesday on Instagram um, where, where I just draw something for an hour and we just talk about whatever, whatever. And um, so I take those pieces and I give them to Sam and Steve and they do what they want with them. So they're going to just, so they choose to auction them and they keep the money. So that, that's, 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 that's their gig, right? It's, oh, cool. So whatever they do. So um, uh, it, it's, it's a nice um, learning experience because we're finding that it's, it's about the engagement. So everything's set at 50 starting bid right for a nine by 12 pencil sketch full figure and um it's just fun right it just gets people to come on and and it's it's, it's to possibly win something at a very a good price i mean so i'm looking just a fun thing like i'm i'm looking at it now and and everything all the bids start at 50 dollars for uh nine by 12 bristol board uh pencil yeah. sketches uh and some of them like damn like like i don't know that's a pretty rad omni man that you have up for uh you know, for 50 bucks. Yeah. Um, so that being said, you know, I would implore anybody to follow uh, you at Koi Fam Art and every Tuesday watch these live draws. Uh, do you, yeah. What time do you do them? Uh, it's 8, 8 p.m. Eastern time. United okay. States. So uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So that being said, if you are listening to this episode on the day of its release, you should absolutely be checking that out tonight. Right. At 8 wow. p.m. at Koi Fam cool. Art. Do you see that? Yeah. That's called yeah. professionalism, baby. I can predict what's going to happen in three days. <laughs> right. um, Very cool. You're like Biff from Back to the Future. But it. Do you have, <laughs> you have no idea how many times I've been told that. <laughs> nice. Um, right, right. How do you choose what you draw? Oh, we really do it very loose. So um, we try to have some kind of theme, but ultimately, uh, it's, it, to me, it's just a place to hang out. Right. So sometimes it works best if like uh, the kids come up with something because they're familiar with and I like learning new things. I like drawing obscure characters. So mm -hmm. so if I haven't drawn the character before, I usually get amped up for that. And sometimes we just take requests from the from from the, the crowd. So it's just very loose and, and a lot of fun. When you said the kids, of course, I mean, you're talking uh, you said Psalm, right? That's your daughter yeah. who I just met for the first time. I right. believe at um, Terrificon, at, Terrificon right. uh, at a casino in in uh, Connecticut, where I meet everybody. Um, yeah, very course. a very talented and brilliant young woman in her own right, and she is helping you run uh, your your website as well. I see on the about, it's you, yeah. it's Heather, and and it's Psalm, and she is, uh, you know, so so this is a family affair. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 uh, because we want to put out so. So um, basically to kind of like unify all of these themes, right? Because to me, it's like, like, like this conversation and a lot of things I was doing before, it's like different personas, different facets, different elements of my life keep getting split into different, depending who I'm talking to, right? So to me, it's like, let's, let's gather all these pieces and just make it one un, you know, unified, genuine thing, right? So um, yeah, it's, it's a family affair. And to me, it's like, I want people to know that, um, like it can be, it's, it's whatever we stand for, I'm putting it out there, right? That's what we, we stand for. I'm putting it out there. And if, and if it resonates with you, great. That's a genuine connection I want to have. Mm. Right. And if, and if, and if it's for, if you, have a, if you have a problem with it for some reason, then there's somebody else for you. Keep walking. Right. You're upsettingly wholesome. Uh, yeah, well, that's you're, you're very, you're very wholesome. It's, it's very, what to, from somebody who's not, uh, and I, and I see it, I'm just like, ah, God, that's, that's so good. I remember, um, during the pandemic, uh, one of the big things was that the hero initiative was doing these, like, and I believe they still are these sort of like live symposiums and, and like basically hour long talks. And yeah. I am a big supporter of the hero initiative and uh, friends with, uh, with Jim McLaughlin. He, he was a guest yeah. on, on Great the, the Great old crew. show. Mm -hmm. I saw that you were doing it. And it was like you were doing this this talk. It was just like an hour long hang 
with you, and then you would get just art after the fact. And so I was like, mm-hmm. that's, I want to do that. So I, I, I wanted to just hang out with you and, and help out the Hero Initiative and get art. Yeah, you got Clawful, right? Which is one of my favorites still. I did that Clawful. I, I asked you for a Clawful sketch. Clawful is a lobster man from uh, Masters of the Universe, my favorite. Uh, I, he's been my favorite character for quite some time. And I was like, that would just be a funny character to like yeah. build a collection around. And so you are on my like, I have a Clawful area in nice. my bedroom yeah. and everybody i remember you posted all those sketches and everyone's like yeah but that clawful though right right <laughs> like right. everybody yeah. became obs- i was like an ob- obscure characters are are all that i want at this point in time yeah. like yeah like as much because i also have um a commission from you uh an 11 by 17 of the of thor cap hulk and iron man right which is right. awesome I remember that awesome and cool it was actually it's a funny story of how i got that in that i was buying a right i remember a cover that i was obsessed with you did a cover of the mighty avengers and it was ultron's face it was like siege it was a siege cover ultron's face with the reflections of the mighty avengers in it and i was i think i even like messaged you and was like i'm obsessed with this this piece it's like it was like one of my favorite pieces and i was like let me buy it and you're like okay and then you accidentally sold it like the day a day later at yeah. a con and you were like yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it was just uh you were like all right man i'll just do this and, yeah and one of was, those things i wish i could do over it's i mean it was fine i'm sure the person that bought it loved it um yeah i was absolutely obsessed with that piece it, it's definitely the girl that got away but you did a commission for me that's so rad anyway uh and that is it's up right next to my bed so oh, I, I think good. of you as I follow. That's asleep. right, right. The as girl I, that didn't get away. As nice. I drift, as I drift into <laughs> into slumberland, uh, and think, Koi's a good dude. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, now I have a question about like the the transition of careers for you. Yeah. Um, okay. And it has to do with a little bit with my own personal knowledge of of your life, which is you have a relatively big family, right? I mean, that's uh, like you have uh, some children and and you have very talented, um, you have a very talented existence. Was it scary to you to leave a potentially, you know, like a very high paying career path to get into art? Like, is that, was it terrifying to do that? Or did you have that confidence? Because I know you said you had this imposter syndrome. So like what, gets you to make that leap yeah it wasn't it wasn't scary what it is 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 what we talk about what i talk about these days uh all the time is you know drawing and doing things with intention right and and um so like kind of going back to that that thing where i was just like miserable over mighty adventures right to me like obviously the transition was pretty easy right like like i'm being being a lawyer the marvel says we want you to quit being a lawyer and i said well this is how much I want to get paid and said, here, Mighty Ventures. So it was a pretty easy transition, right? Really? Um, but, but, but it's like, but, uh, but then it's like, wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't think they'd say yes, right? It's got one of those deals, right? So um, yes, I'd already been doing X Factor and Hercules and these sorts of things, like doing both jobs, right? Mm. But then it's like, okay, you need to quit. So, so here, here are the numbers, let's work it out, right? So in, in that regard, it wasn't that scary, but what's scary was um, I had no training. Right. As much mm-hmm. as I hated being a lawyer, I hated these other things. I love the people. Don't get me wrong. Like where I work, people were awesome. But the job itself, not my thing. But I had training for it. Mm-hmm. This I didn't have any training. So it's like, what, what am I doing? Right. So so I'm I'm feeling miserable. I'm hating what I'm doing. Um, and then Heather, you know, sits me down. And says, okay, what's the deal here? What what, what what? It looks good to me. Right. Yeah. And so 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 she said, what 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 do you like? Right, so I'm looking at, I'm pulling Mike Mignola, that's shelf like yours, so Mike Mignola, Travis Shrey, John Romita Jr., right? Uh, um, Olivia Coypel was 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 huge, um, was starting to get huge mm-hmm. at the time, and and uh, and she's like, none of these guys, none of this art looks the same, like they all look different. Yeah. Right, Chris Bacello, and I was like, yeah, but I love it. And it's like, well, why? It's like, well, I don't know, maybe because they just they just draw the way they want to draw, but then it's like, well, why don't you draw the way you want to draw? Because it's too easy. It's like what? <laughs> Like in order to get paid, in order to have value, I had agreed with myself that I had to slave over it, right? If it was too easy, then it's then it's like this is not this is not right. That, like how could I be so fortunate, 
so so that's set me down the path of like what the hell am i doing like what what's what's wrong with me like why do i have these weird agreements in my head to, to deconstruct it's like what am i going for right so so and this is and so so um that's where my mind was at so so for the, the longest time even as i'm doing comics i was just it just it just wasn't just wasn't clicking right it just wasn't clicking until um you know again it's like like if you're lucky enough to be married to a therapist then then <laughs> all of this is way easier right but uh, it really was like it became like what do you what do you want like to me it's like i can't i can't lose marvel i can't lose marvel like why why, why like, what's 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 so magical about marvel i don't know it's, it's a comfort right but it's like it's the show all... it's it's the big show you know well, there, like... there, 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 there's there's validation there that's like what am i seeking validation for because once i had it i was still miserable right it's like yeah. like i'm in san diego at the marvel booth and it's like i'm not i'm not happy like what's what's happening here right so it's like um so 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 i want i'm not, i'm trying to help people go through that themselves where it's like once like what helped for me was figuring out what am i doing like what mm -hmm. is my intention in doing all this like what what's the point of doing the art anyway like what is it all right it, yeah. it is this like why do we go to conventions? It's the same reason I draw. Same reason I do is to have these connections with people mm -hmm. and share experiences, right? So to me, I'm perfectly fine just constantly talking to people and connecting with people. That's why that's why I am the way I'm at shows because that's important to me as much as the drawing. It's even more important, yeah. right? So these days I understand that the art, the drawing part of the art, is just as important as the talking part, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the the drawing is just another way for me to talk to people. <laughs> right so 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 do you know what i mean so yeah. so that's how i approach it now where it's like when i draw something it's like what do i want to say and what do i want to say through this character and that makes it so much more fulfilling and so much better and it informs me in terms of like what tools do i need to work on mm -hmm. right so a lot of people will come at me and be like hey teach me to do this teach me to draw that draw this way it's like, i could teach you all this stuff buddy right but what do you stand for what kind of story do you want to tell because then those are the those are the things you pack on your trip yeah right so so to me i was like i get this i get this this fear where it's like i'm packing for a road trip but i don't know where i'm gonna go so i'm gonna pack skis i'm gonna pack swim trunks i'm gonna pack you know like everything that's like none of that stuff is gonna fit in the car buddy yeah right so i could teach you how to ski and row and swim but like why where are you going well i don't know i just want to be safe like no 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 you get to decide where you're going that's a very, very interesting viewpoint from it and something that I've honestly like I should have thought of before and like I may have, but then it just escaped my brain. But that's such an excellent point is you're just like, no, nah, man, you decide where you're going. Absolutely. And, and of right. course, you know, sometimes there's detours on your trip. That happens. Podcasting mm -hmm. was not the way I expected to make Absolutely. my bills paid. But I love what I'm doing. I get yeah. to control this now that I'm no longer beholden to a corporate sponsor, an entity, right? Uh, right and that right. I have I have given myself to the people, and they mm -hmm. have uh, they have rewarded me for it better than I ever could have. Right, and and going back to what you were saying about the people who show the portfolio at conventions, right? It's like what I have seen, which is really it's it's, it's such a weird thing that comic artists quote unquote experience. What I see is in terms of talent level, ability, you know, technical ability. I challenge anybody to find artists more talented than comic artists, even aspiring comic artists, right? Mm -hmm. Comic artists can draw everything really well. But if you talk to artists, you know, traditional artists, right? Like painters and, and sculptors, um, I find that they actually don't like drawing. Sometimes, right? A lot of times I listen to podcasts of artists and, and they're like, oh, what do you think about drawing? I hate it. I just, I just, I just, I just, I just grind through it so I can get to the fun stuff. But I was like, holy crap. Right. And then you see artists, quote unquote artists, which they are. I'm just trying to just distinguish from the yeah. comic people. It's like, they don't really seem to care about how good they are. They care about their message. Yeah. I mean, right? that's the so, point of art, right? Absolutely. Right. So, so that's the stuff where I had to struggle. And it's like, listen, I don't, I don't need to be able to draw like Travis Sheree. I don't need to be able to learn how to do this like that person because as long as I know what tools I need for what I'm doing, that's the only things I should be working on. And I would like to add too, because we've been dancing around and talking about it, but and of course, you know, I, I will um, share some photos uh, of, of your art, some, some of your art to show people um, and everything like that. But I've always viewed your, your work as sort of this 
stylized love letter to the Silver Age. And I don't know if that's actually what you're going for, but you have this very, uh, it's like, it's direct and clean, but also very stylized. And I've always really enjoyed it. Even, you know, I've met lots of artists that, you know, I've gotten along with and I've been like, I don't know if I like that style, but I like this person and that's Mm -hmm. totally okay. Um, With you, I really enjoyed that style. Like the way the Mighty Avengers was done um, and that sort of like it had a very sort of like Silver Age, almost Kirby-ish storytelling aspect to it. Yeah, you get that with Dan, right? Dan's awesome that way. And your art complemented it so well that Mm -hmm. when you were telling me how much you weren't enjoying, you didn't you weren't happy with what you were doing. um, it, It kind of in a way is shocking to me. Well, well, you can see the um, the transition, right? So, so the it was working with um, the the overwhelming pressure of following Frank Cho, right? The great Frank Cho <laughs> with then with Brian Bendis, right? Like, come on, like that's like. Ugh. By the time I'd gotten over to Dan, I'd worked through a lot of those things with Heather, where I was starting to be more comfortable in what I was doing. But early on, I was like, this is just this is this is ugh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I think about that a lot sometimes when you look at um, a lot of the storylines uh, and like a lot of the creative teams that come after a superstar mm-hmm. combination a- yeah. and and you look at it and the ones that really knock it out of the park are the ones that aren't going to stress too. I remember, I remember after Batman Hush mm-hmm. came out. The person that took over Batman after Hush, I believe it was Brian Azzarello. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, was the right? writer, and and it might have been Eduardo Risso that did the art, it, but it was a very, it was a very very incredible run that was so off of what Batman Hush mm-hmm. was, mm-hmm. and then afterwards Judd Winnick took over writing. And yeah. and I believe he worked like Dustin Nguyen and a couple other great ones. And that's yeah. where we brought back Jason Todd and brought did the Red Hood storyline. Absolutely. And not worrying because you think a lot about like like storylines that are sort of iconic, like Batman Hush by Jeff Loeb and Jim Lee, who mm-hmm. are considered two at the at the time, the, the top of the game. And then you see what comes afterwards. And in a way, it's elevated. Because they, it looks like they didn't stress or worry about what came before. Yeah, that's a good headspace to be at, right? I mean, I remember Dustin following Travis Charest on Wildcats. And it's like, wow, yeah. how do you follow Travis? I like this. This is great. Dustin's great, right? So it's like, it ha- like it's that mind space, that mindset that, <laughs> that um, you know, you, like people don't know. You got you to work on as much as the skills are important. You got to have the right mindset and confidence mm-hmm. right in terms of like being yourself and, and a lot of times you know you, we, you see with comic artists especially there's this desire to draw other people's characters and that shows to me a lack of confidence uh in terms of letting people see who you are so it's like i want to be seen but not that closely right i want to be seen as someone who can draw batman really well but don't dive d- too deep to get to know me yeah that right? that Vers- there is this aspect in comedy of well of like the coasting where if you follow somebody that's incredible that you're like oh i'm nervous i can't how am i supposed to follow that and i'm like what are you talking about this is what you do why do you do this if you're not if you're not comfortable enough to follow somebody who is a killer like if you can't kill why are you on this show exactly like and remind yourself of that yeah Um, exactly otherwise do your own show right like do something else to get to that place a funny side effect is one of my favorite things to do before somebody goes up on stage if like we're all comics in the background is like hey real quick try not to think about how you're not very good at this Ah, nobody's gonna want (laughs) to see you and then just really throw that curveball we like to have fun yeah yeah exactly um (laughs) but now so you went from sort of like you you went from sort of like doing the candle at both ends situation with you know law as well as um as doing the art and then marvel's like yes we will pay you this thing that you and you're like oh but i can i can just do this um yeah, yeah. and so now you had so so it kind of like you rose very quickly um from my perspective, not from your perspective, 
And I yeah. certainly want to make sure that I'm not, you know, I'm not like, wow, you had a meteoric rise. Yeah, uh, right. I, I, right. I am aware of the hard work and effort that one would put in to have a meteoric yeah. rise. Um, so then um, you get Mighty Avengers. Uh, you're you're kind of wailing away on it. It's great. So what's the like, what's your plan at that point in time? Stay with Marvel? Well, here here's um, so. So as I'm unpacking these things in terms of what I want to do, it, just, it goes beyond the career then it goes into the rest of your life, right? So I want, I want to spend more time with the family, spend more time with the kids, or I want to be a better parent, you know, better, better, better spouse. All of this stuff comes into play. So, so really like, that, like a, a big part of that time was like, um, you know, like, like uh, the cocoon, right? Just, just metamorphosizing. Is that the word, uh, you know, and, and really yeah. just, it's, it's a big like jumbled mess of just, everything was just open right mm, yeah. let's just let's just sort through this and it was um it's, it's challenging times right this this trying to figure out like how like what do i want because now i have a lot of pieces that i want mm -hmm. but but i can't be on autopilot now i really have to be intentional and use and, and make this work right so so a lot of um you know like like a lot of getting most of it had to do with getting your head straight you know what's yeah. important what's not important right and and so um, there was a lot of growth, and to me, it's 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 the mindset stuff is what really makes the art stuff work better, mm -hmm. right? So so it's like I want to draw, I want to draw, but like you know, like, like I, I knew I, I couldn't I couldn't draw until I got everything else straight, right? So yeah. a lot of that time was just kind of like um, all right, let me just pull back a little bit, like you know I was doing Avengers and doing whatever came after and whatever came after, and I was like let me just pull back. And just, just get just get my head straight, all right. But mm -hmm. once you know, once I got, once I knew what it was about, and you know what my priorities were, and how I was going to do it, um, I feel like I got better. I mean, and and I, and I get that feedback. I'll go to people and say, "Oh, you got better." It's like, hmm, is that like, thank you, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there are artists that improve because they're just doing it more. And then there are artists that literally stay the same because they became millionaires making art a specific way. And why the hell would they change it? Yeah. Um, I think uh, a good example of that uh, is Rob Liefeld, who I don't I never fault for his art style because I yeah. don't I believe in style. I believe that everybody is allowed to have their own style. And if people like it and they and it sells, they should do that. But I look yeah. at a lot of his work now and I look at, you know, copy of like brigade number three or something i'm like oh it's the same it's been yeah. 30 years and it stayed the same but the reason it's stayed the same is because that's the style that did well for, for well, here, somebody. Here, here, here's my take on it and and um full disclosure i consider rob a friend yeah um but but to me rob is a true artist mm -hmm. meaning um what is art right uh, I'll, I'll give you the clip I'll, I'll, I'll spoiler it for you but to <laughs> me art is um connecting with other people all right, in, in a shared experience kind of way. Rob is a master connector. Mm -hmm. All right, I mean, the dude's doing Levi commercials back in the day. Like the, the, With Spike the Lee. The guy yeah. knows how to connect, right? So to me, his actual drawing is just another facet of his ability to connect, mm -hmm. right? The, the, like he knows how to connect. And it's like, like, I believe if you see what Rob puts out, that's Rob. Right. Mm -hmm. You look at his art, that's Rob. Because you meet Rob, that's Rob. Like to me, that's you're going to get like a straight, like, like, like like intravenous right pure rob yeah absolutely 24 7 mm -hmm. right and to me like that that is that's the job of the artist like that's the job of the artist to get people to know you as much as you can exactly and 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 i do see that and that style and i think jim lee is another good example of that absolutely. where it's like you have a style that people that has resonated with people for over 30 years yeah at this well, here, point here's in time. what i love about jim right jim is um and he, he's a big influence to a lot of people, right? But but to mm -hmm. me, as as an Asian, I, I do. Here's what I take from Jim, right? To me, he's um he's heroic to 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 go against the Asian tradition, right? And very and famously, yeah, because he was yeah, he was a uh, I mean, in lifestyle wise, like uh, yes. he was a a med student that Absolutely. was fast tracked to become a doctor, and instead right. was like nah. And then I right. see that in you a lot with the law. And venture capitalism and then shifting towards comics. Uh, right. So in terms of like a kindred spirit, I guess, like mm -hmm. why Jim Lee's art works and why it doesn't work when being aped is that Jim is a hero 
to many, mm -hmm. many Asians, especially. So it makes sense that what you see on the page is heroic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like his figures are heroic. They're this just, just dynamic heroism at its best because this dude is a hero in my mind, right? So, so when you, when you mimic Jim Lee, are you bringing the same experiences that Jim Lee brings to the table? Or do you have the same shared um, heroism and sacrifice and, and, and just fighting the system that Jim brings, right? Because if you don't, it doesn't quite translate that great to me. It's, right? it's it, yeah, it's it's like a like a diet Coke. Like you're like, well, I get that the flavor is kind of there, but it really isn't the same. Right. So you don't feel the heroism. Mm -hmm. And Jim Lee as a personality puts himself out there. Everyone knows the med school story. So 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 it it, it plays into this message of heroism, mm -hmm. right? So so if you're someone who's just behind the scenes just copying, I don't know who you are. I just know that you are copying the Jim Lee thing. Right. Which and we could be, we saw that a lot in the 90s. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So, 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 but why does it fall flat? Right. Because technically, very sound, technically amazing stuff, but it's not until these, I call them laborers. Right. If you're just doing something that somebody else's style and you're getting paid for, you're, you're, you're laboring. You're, you're, you're the laborer. You're, you're putting it together to the Ethan Allen couch. But Ethan Allen has a name on Ethan Allen is the creator, the designer, the artist. Mm -hmm. You're just the, the, the amazing couch builder behind the scenes. Do you, do you watch Cartoonist K Fabe or listen to them at all? No, I don't. I don't. It's uh, Ed Piscor and Jim Rugg. So it's two like oh, okay. kind of like uh, outlaw comics guys. Yeah. And they refer to them as jobbers. Yeah. The guys right. that they go in and they do the job. Yeah. If that's your thing and that's your message you want to put out there, then to me, I, I liken that to a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. Right. Some people, they just want to be the best at building the damn thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And they don't care how obscure they don't care. People don't even like it. They're they're creating it for other builders. Mm -hmm. Right. So a jazz musician could be at a lounge with five people who also play jazz and they just love just the geekery of doing it at such a high level. So um, the job or even labor kind of undersells if that's your passion, that's your passion. Right. You're, 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 you're a jazz musician or right? you don't mm -hmm. really need the recognition of the art. You just want to be you just want the, um, the, 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 the camaraderie of other builders. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's not the case for most people. So 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 these these Jim Lee um, technical uh, artists, um, it's awesome to see them create their own voice. Right. And now when you look at this stuff, it's like, well, I get who you are now. And it's way more fulfilling. It's not it may not even be, be like technically as proficient, but I enjoy it more. I, I think when you look at uh, and, and this is something interesting, when you look at the people that sort of um, in the comics world uh, hold on for such a long period of time with style that people like people that might not have been immediately received well. And a good example, I think might be Mike Mignola mm -hmm. and, and Mike Mignola who was doing Marvel DC work. He, he famously did an issue of X force um, that people were like, I don't, this isn't what I signed up for kind mm -hmm. of a thing. Cause he has a very unique style. And in the long term. He is one of the biggest artists in comics history because he never compromised his style, no matter what other fa like the fans that are like, well, I just want if I'm watching reading X-Men, I want a burn or a Paul Smith or, you know, or like anybody yeah. that sort of has that yeah. very clean. And you look at some great artists that that all have a very similar style. So when I see it, I, I try to avoid the use using the word style. I, I get what it means, but mm -hmm. as the on um, from the creator side, if you think in terms of style, um, you're going to get lost from, from the, what when I work with people. It's about who you are and your message. And this really hit home when um, I read an interview with, about uh, Isad Ribic. Right, I'm not even saying his name right. Awesome, awesome artist. Great, for, um, very talented painter. Yeah, amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question to him was, what character? do you would you want to do and he said i don't care about the character i care about the story yeah right it's like listen i i i have my thing and if the character fits my thing i'll do it if it doesn't I'm not doing it right and to me that's like that's it like th that's what it's about you you have a specific thing you want to say like i would never do a a, a cheesecake you know book because that's obviously not my thing mm -hmm. right like I, I i wouldn't i wouldn't touch it right um so, so knowing what it is and saying no to things that are not you, right? That requires confidence and that requires yeah. not feeling needy, not feeling desperate, right? And that's where, that's where the work is. Like, 
like, you know what? No, thanks. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. I've I've had that experience happen more in comedy and in podcasting lately where I'm confident enough to be like, I don't have the time and energy to be able to do this right now. Yeah. Maybe in the future we can work on something. Um, it's not, you know, it's just that this isn't for me. This show isn't for right. me or, or, or whatever. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I guess instead of the word style, maybe voice might Perfect. be a more accurate uh, word to to describe that. That Absolutely. artistic coming from um, someone who uses his voice as as his profession. Absolutely, that's perfect. That, yeah, that's the perfect word for it. And you can see that voice in all of these artists. And um, absolutely. And I did a, I did have a question for you. Is like, who are your sort of like, if you had a Mount Rushmore of of comic artists for mm-hmm. your specific preferences, not like who you th- you know. You're like, oh, well, I'd say people would say Jack Kirby and John Romita and Jim Lee and Todd McFarlane or whatever. Like, what's mm-hmm. your who would be your Mount Rushmore of comics artists? So so um, understanding now, like 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 a different perspective on how I see things in terms of artists and mm-hmm. art itself. Uh, I recognize with me as it is with other people, it is a comfort. Right. So it is mm-hmm. that feeling of connection I had when I needed it. Right. Art yeah. be damned. Right. Yes. That's really what it comes down to. Right. So so I like really crappy Red Sox teams back in the day. Wade Boggs. Right. Because it's, it, it was there. Right. It, it, I so, so, you know, isn't it funny that um, Wade Boggs was the best third baseman of the Boston Red Sox? Yeah. And it's also how you harvest cranberries. Oh, a, a very New England. Thing you too. you Wade Boggs. Really? Well, I mean, I yeah, like uh, cranberries grow in bogs, which are um, right. which are essentially um, sort of brackish swamps. Yeah. Uh, and so huh. you would literally to harvest them, you would have to wade in them. Oh, well, how about that? It's a very um, it's a very re- Boston statement that I made uh, on, yeah. my, on my recent trip home. And I was like, <laughs> this is an embarrassing pun. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice. And even Bostonians are like, wait a minute. Yeah. Why didn't I put that together? Well, that is why I asked who your Mount Rushmore would be, because I I don't think it's about who you think is like the most technical, but who gives yeah. whose voice spoke to you the most? Let's, and, 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 you know, four or five people. You yeah. Know. Yeah. So so in terms of, um, yeah, growing up, it's obviously it was the Chris Claremont X-Men. Right. So um, John Romita Jr. and all of the guest artists. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, Rick Leonardi, Art Adams, you name it, everybody who drew X-Men. And they always seem to get like the most um, the artists with the strongest voices. Mm-hmm. Right. And the thing that really shocked me years, years, years later that I was a John Byrne. Right. Years later, I, I attributed um, more of the books that early on to John Romita Jr. And I realized, wait a minute, it's this dude named Paul Smith. Right. And I was like, holy crap, I was sleeping on Paul Smith because I jumped on right when Paul Smith was ending. Mm-hmm. And it switched over to John Ray Jr. So I just assumed in my memory that it was all John. But it's like, no, this Paul Smith guy is that's really really gives me the feels. That's Paul Smith. Yeah, that's all Paul Smith is, I think, for a lot of people, John Byrne and Paul Smith are their base X-Men. Yeah. Depending on the yeah. generation that they grew up in. Um yeah. which I think is that really me, is yeah, it really makes me feel cool. like a little kid, right? But yeah. like, but later on, like Barry Windsor Smith, right? I and mean, that's mm-hmm. that's where it's like, okay, now now this is legit in terms of like I didn't know you could do this. So you, with your John Romita Jr. So are you an X-Men John Romita Jr. Where you, of like that 80s where it was very much the yeah. Marvel House um, voice or Marvel House style that we used to use? Yeah. Or do you do you view his work as he crescendos from the later 90s into the 2000s that you see his work on Amazing Spider-Man with um, J.M. Straczynski where he really finds his own style? Saga it, stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, instead of being you know, the literal John Romita Jr. where, you know, when you look a lot at a lot of his X-Men stuff, you can see a lot of his father in there. But then when you see like amazing Spider-Man, when Straczynski took over and they took Romita along for the ride and and his stuff was just so different than what it used to be. Like there's not a lot of artists that you can really see a sort of a massive shift in yeah. Well, that's funny. Um, so so I read X Men a lot, and um, it, it started to not really jibe with with the message I wanted to put out there and receive because it started started getting really dark, mm-hmm. you know. And it's just like like Marauders and stuff. I, like I appreciate um the skill, but it just wasn't resonating with me. So so I kind of stopped 
reading comics all together. Um, but then later on, um, I dove back in and I was like, hold on, hold on. How, what's John Meter Jr. Doing, doing these days, right? Yeah. And then I picked up his amazing like stack. And I just just went through the, the, the boxes at the comic store, just bought all of them. Mm-hmm. Like, to me, that is his, my favorite of his work was his Spider-Man stuff. Yeah, I mean, that stuff was, it was really cool and very unique and um, very divisive for a lot of people. A lot of people was didn't, oh, didn't okay. like, a lot of people didn't like a lot of the way he did faces. Um, I loved it because it was so different than, okay. Uh, for those of you that aren't comics fans that are listening, the nineties had essentially a comics implosion. And a lot of that had to do with, um, when we keep using the word, um, but style over substance, Mm -hmm. a lot of people Mm -hmm. were making, uh, beautiful things that were considered collector's items. Uh, Mm -hmm. the, and the industry sort of fell apart under its own weight. Uh, and there were a lot of people that, as we had spoken about before, the people that were sort of aping Jim Lee. And then when people come out, uh, when you see comics have this renaissance in the early 2000s, that really is sort of like the independent, mature titles. Marvel's doing Marvel Max. Uh, and you see like all their more popular books. And the art is so aggressively different mm-hmm. than that early image era of like the cross hatching and stuff. And you see these these guys that were finding their voice in the 90s that are really exploding in a great way, like you see Mike Allred, Steve Dillon, um, all these like these vertigo artists and, you know, Sean McManus uh, really sort mm-hmm. of uh, knocking that out of the park. And it sort of is a rejection of what destroyed the industry. Uh, and I, I, I challenge anyone to look at the comics from like 2001 to 2005. Look what came out and what gained popularity. Mm-hmm. It is fascinating to me because now these are the things that are all becoming huge hit shows. Mm-hmm. Like Why the Last Man trailer just dropped for that. Um, yeah. The Boys, Invincible, Walking mm-hmm. Dead. I mean, these are all coming out right around that same time. And all of their artwork is so aggressively different. Yeah. Than what yeah, we live in a time now. Right. So mm-hmm. so that was um, when they were pushing the envelope. Not not the whole thing's bust wide open. Oh, yeah. Right. Like to me. So so if somebody wants to come and talk comics and they want to do their story. It's like this. This is the time. There is no house style. There is only your style. Yep. All right. There's only your style. And there's so many ways to get the message out. All right. And um, so it depends on how you look at it. Right. So you can look at it as like oh, Marvel and DC have access. So such easy access to artists from around the world. Right. Now it's become the job has become more scarce. <laughs> I don't ascribe to that. Um, scarce mindset right to me now it's like well now i have access to all the buyers Mm -hmm. right so there's an abundance of buyers for everybody now so i want marvel dc to do well i want them to have access to all these buyers everyone does well and they can hire anybody they want and there's plenty of jobs that's how it should be right this there's no um because we're seeing with this pandemic people need this stuff Right, they poo poo on artists, they poo poo on creators. It's like, oh, come, like seriously, without it, you guys are like, oh, I can't believe my shows aren't coming because of stupid COVID. Right? It's like, but, like, but, but you act like I'll oh, be only, I'm like, you're always looking for not this, this, this um old fashioned view of art, right? Like, where's the yeah. bargain? Where's the bargain? Where's the bargain? It's like, no, no, artists should demand top pay. All right. Yeah. That's that's how it goes. And Neil Adams has been preaching it, and I'm I'm on board with the Neil Adams thing. Right? It's like you gotta do you. Why not make as much as doctors and lawyers? Why not? I I definitely agree with that as somebody who has, you know, provided and and has undervalued. I've undervalued myself when I sold Mm -hmm. myself to uh, the previous company that I did the show for. I really undervalued myself per episode. Um, Mm -hmm. And only now that I am running this independently and seeing what people want to do to be able to listen um, and you know, if you're listening for free because you don't want to be on the Patreon, that's fine. You know, I don't get mad about it as long as you're listening and telling people that you enjoy it, mm-hmm. you know, but also I'm making a much more subsistence income doing mm-hmm. this than I was before. And that really came to like me learning how to ask, Yeah, you know, yeah. and in standup comedy in LA, standup comedy like doesn't pay. Well, I'm going to ask yeah. now every time someone wants to book me for a show. What's it pay? right on, right? On. And that's awesome because I was going to correct something I said earlier when I said, um, 
you know, just wait for your thing. No, don't wait. Yeah. Like you are in control. You go after it. Like what, what you're just saying, right? So to, to, there is no waiting. If you're waiting, then you don't, you don't have to. You can go do your own thing and make it happen. This is very motivating. It's a very <laughs> motivating episode, which I think, which makes a lot of sense because we're going to talk about something that we've like kind of like dipped our toes in a little bit here, yeah, which yeah. is the mentoring program that you have um, that, I mean, you really, I saw the push for it like a couple months ago, maybe where you were like, I'm doing yeah. this thing yeah, and it seems really cool. Um, so tell me about that because my nephew wants to be an artist. Yeah, yeah. Really and great meeting. And and we we spoke a little bit because he's still young. He's 17. He's very mm -hmm. much like he wants to do pinups and stuff. And I was talking about like, well, you know, do you want to look at art school or do you want to learn this? And he's like, ah, I don't know. I just want to do my thing. And I'm like, well, that's great. Mm -hmm. But you should definitely learn more as yeah. opposed to like I was like, you know, I was like, you're good for 17. How are yeah. you going to make you great for any age? Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, that was fascinating me. Tell me more, tell me more about your, your mentoring, uh, program. Well, yeah. So, um, it wasn't something I wanted to do at first. Uh, people have come up to me in the past. Hey, do you want to be a mentor? And I was like, what is that? What, what? Like, no, <laughs> right. It's like, I don't know what that is. Um, but, but, um, Heather, uh, ha has been my mentor and I have mentors too. Um, but she has, uh, she's a, she, you know she's a therapist and a life coach and she really works um with people and works with me and she said um you know like like you should mentor and i said what and then uh and then, um we listen to a lot of self-motivation books here like a lot like basically you name it we probably have it on audio and we probably listen to it right so my mind was already in that state but i thought like what do i have to offer you know what i mean like like there are art teachers there there there's this person that person and it's like um but then I'm, I'm, it's more like, okay, fine, fine. I guess I'll just teach art lessons then, right? Fine, yeah. I'll, I'll do it. And she's like, no, trust me, you got to do this. Trust me. So I was like, oh, I'll just teach art lessons. And I'm finding that it is, um, it's not the art lessons, man. It's really this, it's like I have an experience. Everyone has their own experience. Everybody should be a freaking mentor, right? Because I have this experience that, 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 that's unique. It's not unique to me, but it is um, other people. I can use it to resonate with other people and connect with them, right? So you're so it's you're going really well your perspective is unique yes i think i think put it. you know like you're like well my experience isn't unique which it is you yeah. know but but i understand we never really it, it's it's always interesting you never we never tell people that we're interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. look at the name of my podcast like it's not about me it's about how yeah. i have people that are interesting and i say that because like yeah i i always poo poo I don't, or I, I don't try to advertise like all the stuff I've done. And then people find out yeah. like, oh, so you were a teacher before this and you were yeah. a boxer before this and you worked at a comic yeah. shop and you did all this. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And people are like, yeah. no, that's a, that's a very unique uh, perspective and experience to have. Right. Right. And, and, um, and uh, they, they, they may resonate with it. Right. Yeah. So when it comes to like the, the mentoring stuff, it's, it's, it's um within the, the board mentor, there is um, skills transfer, like teaching. Mm -hmm. And then there's also coaching and there's facilitating. There's a lot of things that come with the mentoring thing. Um, so there's the skills transfer, but a lot of uh, what I do is, um, is the coaching, right? And it is like, it's, so the way I look at it, um, so, so, so sports people, are you, you're, you're a sports um, Uh I do have a, a podcast bit. that says you don't even like yeah. sports. So I exactly, guess a little bit. Yeah, exactly. So like, so like uh, a Tom Brady, you know, quarterback NFL won like a gazillion Super Bowls. I've heard of him. He still hires coaches. Right. Oh, like yeah. he's like, there's things I want to work on. I'm going to hire this coach to, to help me have the discipline and the accountability to get this done because I know what I want. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Serena Williams, all these, like wh whatever profession aside from the system you're in, um, even super successful established people will seek out coaches to work on specific things. Right. So mm -hmm. that's what I try to offer. So to me, like not everybody's a fit for me. Yeah. Right. So it's like, listen, um, I only work with people, who kind of know what they want, right? So, so it's like, listen, I'm, I'm going to spend three months and I want to work on my short pass, right? Like t Tiger Woods, I'm going to spend three months, I want to work on my putting. I'm going to, you know, mm -hmm. like, like these are things I think, you know what I mean? Because I really believe people have the answers themselves. Like it's not for me to tell you what 
So when I when I watch old videos of me giving advice, like, oh yeah, just copy the people you like. Oh no, don't don't listen to that guy. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, All right. So there's that cringe aspect that you were talking yeah, about. Yeah. So it's like, oh, he might get you in, but like that's probably not where you want to be because now you're stuck doing that. <laughs> right. So so don't do that. So what I try to do now is like, listen, I'm gonna we, we work better if you know what you're trying to do and you just need someone to kind of hold you accountable and show you the skills even on how to achieve that. Right. So like a Tom Brady is like, I'm, I miss, I'm missing all my, my 20 yard drops or right? I need someone to, to help me you know, get get a nice soft touch. That's what I do. Right. But, but whatever you want um, that's what I work on because I do have the experience to, to, to get that done. But what I'm finding a lot of times is, is um, people don't know what they want. Right. So yeah. there's that too. It's like, okay, what exactly do you want? So it's, 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 it's really a lot of fun. It really allows me to, to connect with a ton of people in ways that um, I wasn't yeah. able to do before. And so if that is, I, I will add, cause I know, I know we got to let you go. I know you have a, a, an appearance coming up in a second and, and, you know, I get that. Um, but you can check that out um, at uh, Koi fam.com. It's K H O I P H A M dot com slash mentoring. Um, I would say go to koifam.com anyway. It is a really fascinating website to look at. And I've almost spent like a lot of money during this as I was like yeah. researching it. I was like, oh, maybe I should get that. I don't have that. I can get nice. that. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, and Koi, again, you uh, we can find you on Instagram at koifamart, K-H-O-I-P-H-A-M-A-R-T. Uh, yeah. on Instagram, right? That's that's what we should do. We should follow you on there because you post a yeah. lot of cool stuff, um, including clawful drawings. Uh, yeah, it's not yeah, a big deal, yeah. but it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah like I, I try to um, treat all the socials um, separately. I don't, I don't, so so Instagram is a certain place where I, I, where I you know, provide certain content. Facebook is a place where I provide certain content. And I also have like a Facebook mentoring page where I provide different kind of content. Okay, right? where do we find so, that? Oh, I think uh, it's like I think it's just Koi Fam Art and Mentoring. Real hard. Is it Fam instead of Fam? Have I been saying your name wrong my entire life? It's it, they're both fine. It's both fine. Are you it's sure? Fam, but it's Fam, but Fam is cool too. Okay, well that seems wrong. That seems like <laughs> I see. It seems like I've just you just told me that I've made a, a twelve year mistake. Oh uh, no, no, it's uh, it's something where it's just um, the the, de the decoder box in my brain just hears it the same no matter how people say it. So I don't even notice. I, I say Fam. You could say fam. Well, then fam care. is the proper way to say it, man. <laughs> there you go. If you're like, well, here's how I say it. I'm like, well, then that's your name. <laughs> yeah, but fam sounds so street. So I'm cool with that too. Yeah, yeah but it's not your name in the same, like, you're just like, look, you've been whiting up <laughs> my name for the past 12 years and that's fine. Um, well, now mm -hmm. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I say your name correctly obviously. Um, so we've got, uh, the Twitter, the Instagram, uh, the Facebook page, Koi Fam, uh, art and mentoring, uh, any books, anything we should be on the lookout for what, what should we order or grab? Oh yes. Yeah. So I'm doing a bunch of covers for, for all the companies, but what I'm, uh, for interiors, I'm currently working with Greg Pak on a milestone. So a, a duo, the duo book for the milestone relaunch. That's coming oh, out. Great. You know, so, you know what's cool? I uh, literally just got all of the those old milestone books. Uh, did you get Zombie with it too? Because I, I totally slept on Zombie. I didn't even know that book existed. Zombie wasn't there, but back in the day, I had Zombie number one platinum. No kidding. Back in the all day, right. and I didn't couldn't find it. I do still have my Exo Man of War number zero gold though. Oh, um, nice. But I did find uh, my mom's friend. A friend of the family, when I was back home, invited me to her house and said, look, my son wanted me to throw all these out. Go through them. Take whatever you want. We'll sell them at the yard sale or throw them out or whatever. Yeah. And and so like there was all these like milestone books like static and, and, and everything like that. And I was like, well, I'm just going to grab these because these are cool. Mm -hmm. And then there was like a, a first appearance of Harley Quinn. Oh, Okay, in there like a batman small. adventures yeah. 12 and i was just like yeah. are you sure i can have all these and she's like he literally told me to throw them out just take what you want and i was like this is a you know what i'm not going to tell you what this is yeah yeah exactly <laughs> i'm like i'm just going to yeah, take you this. are welcome yeah yeah you live in a house i live in an apartment it's fine. <laughs> exactly uh, yeah, but, yeah but so so yeah so this duo thing i'm doing with greg i guess is the uh, the zombie um uh relaunch i oh, guess that's awesome so it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of fun do we know when it's going to drop it keeps getting pushed back because of the pandemic stuff, but uh, we're we're well what into pandemic? it. So it's me, Greg, Scott, Hannah, Chris, Sotomayor. 
Oh, wow. So, that is an yeah. all-star team. Yeah, it's fun. Great, great, it's really great, great team. So, uh, um, And that's Zombie, I believe it's, if I remember correctly, X-O-M-B-I? Yeah, but this is called Duo. It's called D-U-O. Duo. Okay, fair enough. So yeah. go to your local comic shop and pre-order Duo. Get it in your previews or tell the, tell whoever's there, I want Duo. Yeah, I want two of them. <laughs> Make mine duo. Yeah, a duo of duos. That's what we yeah. want there. Uh, yeah, they're like duo of what? And you're like, I'm too tired for this. Exactly. Um, do you have um, any appearances uh, that will be coming up soon? I know obviously you have the one tonight as of recording. And, and Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'll be at Baltimore Comic Con. <gasps> but before that, I'm going to be at Long Island Con. Um August 28th, I believe. Okay, so check out Long Island Con, August 28th. Uh, and then Baltimore Comic Con, if you are interested in comic books, Baltimore Comic Con was one of my favorite conventions. Uh, mm-hmm. It was such a pure comics convention, and I used to have a lot of really good fun uh, yeah. when I would yeah. go there. I really loved that one. So if you are comfortable and vaccinated, be vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Just get yeah. vaccinated. Uh, you know, check out Baltimore Comic Con and Long Island Con. Uh, visit Koi. Tell him you listen to the show. Uh, Koi, I am so glad we got to spend some time together. It's so cool that I got to see you the other yeah, day. Yeah. And then we get to have this. Yeah, a lot of fun. We could just talk forever. Honestly, right? so, we um, could. This might be the one of the longest episodes we've done. And I'm okay with that. Uh, I, I'm all right with that. My producer, probably less. Uh, yeah. But that's fine. Uh, Koi, thank you so much uh, for joining me. I appreciate you. Um, you are such same, a cool same, friend. Same, man. Uh, And I I hope to see you uh, face to face sooner rather than later. Maybe next time I go home, I'll make a Philly uh, date. Yeah, sounds good. And if I find myself out in the Burbank area, definitely. Absolutely. And and again, everybody check out koifam.com, K-H-O-I-P-H-A-M.com. Thank you all for listening. See you in two weeks. All right. Bye, everybody. Our artwork is created by Justin T. Brown, who can be found at Artness by Justin Brown on Instagram, as well as artnessbyjustinbrown.com. That dope music you heard is by Troy Nababon, available at Troy Nababon on Instagram, as well as at troynababon.com. Nababon is spelled N-A-B-A. 